Uh, tonight's meeting is asbestos products in buildings, uh, asbestos material awareness. Um, Jeff gave this lecture, similar lecture, uh, to the IBC last month, Institute of Building Consultants, and I thought it was something that was very interesting. Uh, I'm sure, like me, you'll be surprised at the number of products that do contain asbestos uh, in buildings. Um, so, uh, Jeff works for Heggie's Environmental Engineering and Scientific Solutions. Uh, Jeff will give you a little bit of his background. If I could ask you, please, just to welcome him. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Thanks, Alan. Yes, as Alan said, my name's Jeff. I'm a consultant with a company called Heggies. I'm based at Lane Cove and I'm one of their senior project consultants. And I've got a grad dip in safety science. I have a science practitioner's qualification, cert for in auditing and cert for in um, uh, training. Just for the record, I'm not a builder. I, I know one end of a hammer from the other, but I couldn't swing a hammer to save my life. So when it comes to questions, if we can keep them simple, that'd be good. What we're going to talk about tonight is asbestos. It's a highly emotive subject. It uh, raises a lot of fear. It probably deserves a great deal of respect and there's a lot of misinformation out there. So hopefully tonight I'll give you some knowledge and uh, that will be applicable to your industry. We'll just, uh, the talk will take approximately 40 minutes, including questions. And I've got a series of slides here which we'll um, go through. That's all right. So Heggies is the company. The company's been operating now for just over 20 odd years. Started off as a specialist uh, in the uh, acoustics and vibration industry. Do a lot of work with the large developers, especially when they're doing uh, uh, construction next to railway tracks and the like, etc. Or uh, proximity to other adjoining buildings uh, where you know, vibration could be an issue. Now, just a bit of a disclaimer, this information is general in nature. You're not going to come out with a certificate or a license or anything like that tonight you'll come out with some general information. If you have any questions or queries uh, or like further information, please contact Heggie's Direct. We're available on the web and also on the phone. And this material is copyrighted. So uh, if you wish to uh, reproduce any of this, uh, just please ask uh, us and we can sort of arrange for that to happen. So what we're going to be looking at is what are hazardous materials, what is asbestos, how was it used, the health risks. We'll then touch briefly on lead, synthetic mineral fibre, other hazardous materials, and then I'll take some questions if that's all right. Okay, now asbestos has been around since the year dot. They've got uh, recordings of asbestos being used uh, from four and a half thousand years ago. Quite at some time back, Emperor Charlemagne, who was uh, king of the Byzantine Empire, um, sort of impressed um, some people by throwing a blanket woven out of asbestos onto a fire and he pulled it out unsinged and they thought he had magical powers or mystical powers. Um, Strabo the geographer and Pliny the Elder, Pliny was, uh, has written a lot of Roman history, made reference to the health of slaves and uh, Pliny is noted as saying, do not buy a slave who's worked in the asbestos mine for they die young. So even back then they knew there was some link between asbestos exposure and your health but they didn't have the medical technology we do now to make that link. In Australia, unfortunately, 650 people are expected to die from asbestos-related diseases each year for the next 40 years, running at the, really at the beginning of the, the bell curve, unfortunately. And we all have heard of uh, Bernie Banton and other sufferers, and we may even know people personally who have uh, suffered health effects or lost their life due to asbestos exposure. Asbestos was widely used in a number of products in Australia. In the 70s, it peaked at 70,000 tonnes per year. That's a lot of asbestos material. It's been known to have been used in over 2,000 products here in Australia alone. That figure is actually closer to 3,000. It ranged from cement products such as our, what we know as fibro and the Super 6 roofing, through your brake pads, insulation material, filtering media for the food, chemical and pharmaceutical industry, as well as a filler, resins, corkings, etc. The majority of homes, up to 92%, and workplaces constructed before 1979 will contain asbestos products. Now here in New South Wales, there are codes of practice, legislation, and guides that we must follow if we are working with asbestos containing materials. They differ from state to state, so if you were to undertake work in Victoria or Queensland, for example, you'd have to make reference to that state's legislation. 
Here we are governed by the New South Wales Occupational Health and Safety Act, 2000 and its supporting regulation. Work Covers just brought out a new guide called Working with Asbestos. And there's two key documents uh, which relate to those uh, who work directly with asbestos. That's uh, Safe Removal of Asbestos and uh, Asbestos in Workplaces. In general though, when working with hazardous materials, whether it be asbestos or a chemical, or if you're working at heights or with electricity, we apply what is known as a risk management approach and essentially we have to identify the hazard, conduct a risk assessment where we identify the, the hazard and determine their associated risks. We then develop appropriate controls to reduce the likelihood of an incident or an exposure occurring. We allocate responsibility to manage the risk and we monitor and review the controls. And we apply that on a daily basis uh, when we're at work. As an employer, if you have apprentices under your care or fellow employees, you have a responsibility under state-based legislation to ensure that your staff are properly informed and trained as to the hazards and risks in the workplace. Education, training and instruction is necessary to ensure that the person's health and safety for who may be exposed to a hazard. So if you're working with any products that you know contain asbestos, you must make sure that not only yourself but your employees and others who may be on the site are aware of the hazards associated with that material so they can undertake their work in a safe manner. So we'll just reiterate here, for the New South Wales OHS Act, supporting regulation, the code of practice for the management and control of asbestos in workplaces, the code of practice for the safe removal of asbestos and working with asbestos, which is a new guideline just brought out by Work Cover New South Wales. We hear a lot about asbestos and we've got an idea as to what it is. I'll just give you a bit of a background. It's a naturally occurring mi mineral. If we want to talk about it geologically, it's a, it's a silicate material. It's fibrous in structure. That fibrous structure enables it to be used in many applications. It can be woven, it can be spun, it can be added to many materials. Asbestos was widely used because it's heat resistant, it doesn't rot, it's waterproof, it's resistant to chemicals, white ants don't eat it. Unfortunately, it does pose a health risk. And there were three main types of asbestos used. There was chrysotile, amosite and chrysilidite. And when you look at those, uh, each of those minerals in their natural state, they have distinctive colours being white, brown and blue. And we're probably familiar with the term blue asbestos. And on some of the tables there's some samples which are set in resin, which are then inside a clip lock plastic bag, which you can have a view at. And there's also an information card which will state the uh, type of asbestos material that that product contains. On this slide here, working down from the top, we can actually see that there is the colours are, are quite definite with the white, the brown and of course the blue. The blue is the real standout. As was stated earlier, it's, it's naturally occurring. It was mined in New South Wales, it was mined in WA, it was extensively mined in South Africa, Canada, Russia. There are naturally occurring outcrops of asbestos in rock in New South Wales and the central west and of course in WA the mining industry has a, a real issue uh, ensuring that uh, when they do the excavations and their ore recovery that they're not uh, bringing out asbestos at the same time. So we know it's been mined for over four and a half thousand years. Commenced mining in Australia in the early 1900s. They discovered outcrops of it in the sort of late 1890s but it wasn't until about the 1920s that it really started to get underway. The mining for asbestos ceased in Australia in 83 and we stopped exporting it in 84. But we imported it from South Africa and Canada and we're importing chrysotile, that's the white, up to one to two thousand tonnes per year up till 1990, which is not that long ago. And just reiterating, peak consumption, 70,000 odd tonnes in the 70s. So that's a lot of asbestos both mined and being brought into the country that was being used. Chrysilidite was phased out from 1967. Amosite was phased out from the mid-1980s. Chrysotile was banned in Australia in 2003. That's five years ago, according to my calendar. I have some photos here. And what we have here are some of the asbestos workers at Winternoon, which you may, be f uh, may have heard of. 
in WA. And what they are doing is they have asbestos that has been processed and they're packing into the hessian sacks for distribution. And as you can see, they have respirators on. However, they have no other protective clothing. They don't have any coveralls. And they'd be taking that clothing, which would be heavily impregnated with asbestos, home to be washed. Uh, they'd be throwing their jackets in the back of the car. They'd be taking those masks off at lunchtime and sitting down and having it in their crib room, having their meals. They might wash their hands and their face, but they've still got the dust all over their bodies. The next picture here shows a miner extracting the asbestos material. And as you can see there, he has no respiratory protection at all. And the main health effects associated with asbestos are respiratory. This is inside the bagging area. This is a colour photograph, and you can notice the distinct blue tinge. There's no denying that uh, blue asbestos is present on that site. And you may be able to see in this picture a plume of dust, asbestos dust hanging over the main process mill. And of course, that drifts with the wind currents and then sort of descends on the neighbouring environment. Now, with asbestos, here in New South Wales, it's classified as either bonded or friable. These are terms which are not necessarily used in other states. And I'd just like to touch on those, if I may, because they're important to know. Bonded material is any that holds asbestos within a fixed, stable matrix, i.e. if you have a fibro sheet, a fibro roof, fibro downpipe, guttering, that is called bonded. It is one piece. Because when it's in a single sheet, you can't crush it, crumble it, pulverise it, or break it down under hand pressure. However, friable material is any material containing asbestos which can be crumbled, pulverised, or reduced to dust by hand pressure. So, if you're at a building site and you're undertaking excavations for footings and you come across bits of fibro which are confirmed to contain asbestos in the soil, that would technically be classified as friable material because you can get that piece and you could snap it, you could break it. In doing that process, you're releasing uh, dust and asbestos fibres. And it's the asbestos fibres that you can't see that are the ones that cause you damage. And we'll touch on the health effects in a little bit. So we've got broken asbestos sheeting, burnt asbestos products, <coughs> broken asbestos cement sheeting in soil, or sprayed on insulation material. Asbestos containing material that is fire damaged has to be treated with great care because the heat, as you're probably aware, causes cement sheeting to crack, releasing the fibres. And the whole area can be contaminated with asbestos. Asbestos material that you can't see, asbestos that can be easily kicked up in the dust. Again, when you have um, broken asbestos sheeting in, sh sheeting in soil, you don't know how long that piece of material has been sitting in the soil for. may have been there for five years, may have been there for 30 years. But over that time, it would have gone through some weathering process, may have had a bobcat go over it once or twice. Either way, it could have shedded some dust or some asbestos fibres into the surrounding soil. You can pick up that piece, but there still may be asbestos fibres which you can't see in that soil around you. Nice, hot, dry day, a bit of wind comes along, blows a bit of dust across the site. Potentially, there may be asbestos fibres present. So we've got to sort of treat the material with care when we come across it. We have some photos here of bonded and friable. The Super 6 AC roofing, I'm sure as builders you've seen that on many an occasion. It's uh, prevalent on many industrial roofs throughout New South Wales. The next slide here, we see a whole building manufactured out of Super 6. The wall cladding, facially the guttering and the roof. And again, you can see here the gable ends uh, fibro sheeting, which were found to be asbestos containing. They're examples of bonded asbestos because they're fixed, they're in place. To remove bonded or friable asbestos, you need to hold either an AS1 license for friable, or you need to hold the appropriate license from, uh, for, for uh, bonded. You used to be able to remove up to 200 square metres of bonded material. That was reduced down to 50 square metres, and it's now down to 10 square metres. 10 square metres is not much. People are surprised to know that some vinyl floor tiles contain asbestos. Now, whilst the vinyl floor tile, whilst the uh, 
the tiles are in good condition, there's no real risk to your health because the asbestos is so tightly bonded or bound up within the, the vinyl matrix. However, if your profession is lifting up vinyl floor tiles and you've got the heat gun and you, every day you're chopping up floor tiles, the potential for exposure increases because you're actually removing, breaking up floor tiles. Black electrical backing board, and I don't know if you can see it in the photo also, at the back there's a fibro insulation sheeting. There were some brands of black electrical backing board which contain asbestos. This is another example of a, of a uh, electrical box, fuse box, and I'm sure that many of those have been taken off by yourselves in the, in the, over the years. And again, you can see the black electrical backing board, but also the lining of the box itself, probably about two or three mil thick, there's a thin fibro lining there. Again, black electrical backing board, fibro lining, and you can see the environment that it's within. Now, there was asbestos containing dust found on the bottom inside edge of the board. And over the years, they would have had electricians and sparkies, obviously one and the same, doing work there, maybe other people opening and closing, the cleaners perhaps, other people. But of course, you can see from the environment, it's a library, young people, there's a potential there for asbestos containing dust to enter that environment. What we have here is something you may not see that often in a residential sense, but possibly in a commercial or industrial setting. We have a hot water pipe which has asbestos insulation on it. That insulation was like a wrap. It has the same appearance as a plaster, you know, if you have a broken arm or a broken leg and you've got a plaster wrap on. And essentially, the asbestos insulation material is there to protect people from either the heat or the cold that's travelling through the pipe, and also protect the pipe, and it's wrapped on. And if you look on the ground, on the photo here, you can see where some pieces have broken off. Now, of course, as it's broken off, it will have shed a dust. There'll be you know, asbestos-containing dust in the soil, uh, adjacent where the broken pieces are. This material is, is extremely friable. You can break it up with your hand. It can become very easily pulverised. It will generate a lot of dust. It needs to be handled with extreme care. Here's another close-up photo. And you can see the wrap around the pipes. And you can see that the, the insulation wrap is sort of starting to break away. It, doesn't, you know, it has a finite life. It's, it's, it, it, it will degrade over time. And of course, if it's exposed to the elements, that degradation will occur sooner. Again, we have another asbestos insulated pipe running behind the piers here. But again, you can see all this white remnants of asbestos cement dust on the ground from where they actually did the lagging on the site. So if you're going through that floor cavity on your hands and knees, scuffing up the dust, that dust is going into the air. It's going into the air that you potentially may breathe. And so you have to be aware that you may potentially be taking material that contains asbestos into your lungs. And here's just another example of, uh, of insulation. And again, you can just see it's starting to deteriorate. This was in a school. This is uh, on a steel profiled roof, which had been built over. They'd put an extension over it. And beneath the roof, there was an old gas heater. This was the flue, which had since been cut off. But the flue pot was there, and we had this insulation wrap around the joint in the flue, which is a hessian-like material or band that you can see on the photo there. There's my right foot and with a piece or a couple of pieces of what we would consider as friable asbestos, i.e. it's broken asbestos cement sheeting in soil. That was on a, uh, a road site not too far from here, not too far from Bankstown. But again, this is something that is quite common and prevalent. I'm sure we've all come across bits of broken fibro in our time. But this would be classified as friable. We have the pieces here that we can see there's smaller pieces adjacent to it which are broken off, but it's those pieces again that we can't see that may be present in the soil that we have to be aware of. This is a house in Carring Bar. It was being demolished. And this, the exterior wall cladding has been removed. And what we're doing is looking into the bathroom. We can see the back, we're looking into what is the back of the system, but behind the system in the bathroom were some la rather large pieces of fibro, probably a good 10 mil thick 
obviously put there some sort of insulation or support. But again, we have a lot of dust and material on the timber beams behind the cistern here. And again, that contained asbestos. So in the demolition phase here, we had the dust to contend with as well as the pieces of um, fibro sheeting which needed to be removed. Gas hot water heater. I used to rent a property, certainly couldn't afford it, on the lower north shore. And it was an old red brick walk up three bedroom apartment. And one day I thought I'd have a look what was behind the kitchen cupboards. And I removed the kickboards because at the front of the, from the street, from the front, you could see an outline of where there used to be like a heater and a flue or something. I thought, I'm just curious. So I removed the kickboards, had a look behind the cupboards, and sure enough, bits of broken asbestos. But there was also a type known as millboard. It was um, almost like the consistency of wet cardboard. It's thick, but very sort of flexible. It was being put there as an insulation material. I wasn't overly pleased about discovering that. And that could have been there since, well, would have been there since the day they took the gas, gas heating system out from under the kitchen sink. And that could have been, I don't know, 20 odd years ago, maybe more. We have an extension of the house here. It's going through uh, a demolition phase. And again, we have fibro cement sheeting here. Now, the interesting thing about this fibro cement sheeting was that it was painted on the, ex on the outside. On the inside, it was clearly labelled does not contain asbestos in green paint. Out of sheer curiosity, and nothing but, I took a sample, and guess what? It contained asbestos. So the lesson to be learnt there was, uh, if it looks like a duck and sounds like a duck, it probably is a duck until it's proved otherwise. Again, this house here actually had fibre cement sheeting containing asbestos as an interior lining of the walls. Now, my understanding is that's pretty unusual. That's normally um, masonite or gyp rock. But uh, in this case, it proved not to be. And here we have, it's a poor photo, but it shows fibrous cement sheeting. And fibrous cement sheeting that contains asbestos, and this is not to be taken as a, as a, a guy, but a, as a potential indicator that it may contain asbestos, it has a very noticeable dimpled like appearance on one side, like almost like a golf ball. If material like that, it's probable to highly likely that it is asbestos contained, but only when it's sampled and analysed at an art lab can you be sure if it is or is not asbestos containing. What we have here is a small building with a very old corrugated asbestos cement roof. With the roofing, what we have to consider is the dust that's in the ceiling cavity. Because obviously over the years, the roof gets weathered. Hot, cold, expansion, contraction, the rain beating on it. Uh, moss, lichen, algae, etc., can grow on the underside because it's a nice environment. The roofs do become porous after a while. They become extremely brittle, hence the reason why we don't walk on them. But if you go into a ceiling cavity of a building that's got a corrugated asbestos cement roof, it is highly probable that that dust that is settled in the ceiling cavity space will contain asbestos. So therefore, when you enter that ceiling cavity, you want to make sure that as a minimum, you're wearing disposable coveralls, some gloves, which are also disposable, and a respirator. That's appropriate for um, dust that potentially contain, contains asbestos. Now, this uh, photo came from an ACT website, and it just shows some common areas where asbestos-containing materials were used from the vinyl floor tiles to some of the uh, asbestos um, sheeting material and roofing material, gaskets, lagging around pipes, a lot of the old stoves, some very old, not that you see come across them these days, but if you ever come across very old, uh, like kookaburra type stoves, not necessarily the kookaburra brand, but that sort of old style stove, often the rope lagging uh, on those contained asbestos. When I was at school, we used to have Bunsen burners that used to sit on these little white tiles. They'll cross a tile. My father-in-law tells me how they used to have an asbestos uh, dishcloth in the house because his mum used to be able to come along and pick the, uh, the pans off. The Romans, going back to Pliny, uh, the Romans are famous for developing straight roads and their legionnaires, etc. And they cottoned onto the idea that if you have a tavern beside a straight road, which the armies march up and down, you'll be able to sell lots of food. 
obviously the, the more bums and seats, the faster you can turn the crowd through, the more money you can make. They used to have themselves gloves and tails made out of asbestos because they could actually then reach into the fire, grab the hot plate, plonk it down faster, they could have a feed and then they could pick it up and get the next ones through. So it's had a myriad of uses. On the next slide here, the earlier slide said 2,000 products. It is closer to 3,000. Most public buildings built during the 50s, 60s and 70s contain material manufactured with asbestos. Your council chambers, your libraries, your department of works, buildings, etc. A lot of the high rises. And in Australia, in 1919, the standard corrugated sheet was introduced into Australia by Hardy's. We're here at Bankstown and the Hardy's main plant was up uh, near Camilla there, opposite Rose Hill. There were three main manufacturers of asbestos containing products in Australia. There were James Hardy, the Colonial Sugar Refinery, commonly referred to as CSR, and Wonderlick. You may be more familiar with Wonderlick from their roofing tiles. Now, we've touched on the fibro and lagging and vinyl floor tiles and the roofing, but the asbestos containing materials were also found in boiler gaskets, clutch plates, Bunsen burner plates, your wicks and your kerosene heaters, fireproofing, plaster and plaster cornice adhesives, wall sealants, fireproof gloves, blankets, brake pads. Recently you may have heard in the press about a worker with a large Australian uh, motor vehicle manufacturer who would received compensation from asbestos exposure from working on that car's or that brand of cars brake lines. I've met people who have lost loved ones to asbestos related diseases who were in the New South Wales fire brigades because the fireys used to have asbestos blankets and asbestos fire suits. Um, if you undertook your apprenticeship in the 70s or 80s or earlier, it's highly probable that at some stage you would have sawed or chopped through a piece of fibro. So it affects a wide range of, of, of employment types. It's not just one particular group who are potentially exposed to asbestos. A lot of those who worked on the wharves unloading the ships that are bringing the asbestos in from overseas, unfortunately, have uh, suffered health effects because of that exposure. Some common trade names for products that contained asbestos, Hardy Flex, Hardy Plank, Villa Board, Hardy Therm, High Line, Shadow Line, Cover Line, Versalux and Super 6 of course the Super 6 being the roofing that we all know. And there may be some brand names there that you're familiar with or have come across. In the early 1900s, doctors knew that there was a correlation between asbestos exposure and one's health. Now we know that Pliny the Elder had touched on the fact about you know, the asbestos and slaves etc and the health effects. But in the early 1900s, they knew that asbestos workers were dying from respiratory ailments. And Dr. Montague Murray reported on pulmonary fibrosis, which we now refer to as asbestosis, in workers employed in the asbestos industry. And we'll just touch on the health risks now because it's, this is the, the important part. As we all are aware, we have our lungs inside our body. Our lungs take in the oxygen. The gases pass through the cell membranes. The body then takes out the carbon dioxide and that's expelled in our breath. The lungs are covered by two thin membranes which are called the pleura. One's on the inside surface of the lungs and one sits between the lung and the rib cage. Now what happens is with asbestos fibres, asbestos fibres of a certain size and dimension are able to enter our airways and travel deep within the lungs. Now, We've all had colds, we've all worked in dusty environments and have sneezed or coughed and brought up material that reflected the environment we're working in. Our body has a defence mechanism within which is able to extract some of the material that enters our lungs. Obviously in a perfect world we try and reduce the amount of dust or other foreign material as possible entering our lungs. With asbestos though, because of its, if it's of a certain size and shape, the body is unable to expel it. So it enters your lungs, and if it goes to the deepest part of your lungs, it can remain lodged there. And they can result, 
or may lead to one of four types of asbestos exposure related diseases and we'll just touch on those briefly. The pleural asbestos is a scarring of the thin lining of your lungs and that is due to breathing in the asbestos fibres. It may be diffused, i.e. all over, or just localised in a particular area. Asbestosis is a progressive scarring of the lung where what happens is, and I'll keep this very simple, is the asbestos fibres penetrate the lung lining. The body tries to smooth over that penetration, not too dissimilar to a, a grit of sand and an oyster shell, and over time it puts layers and layers and layers over, which become a, a pearl. Effectively has a scarring like effect on the lungs. Obviously, your lungs take in the oxygen, release the carbon dioxide as well as water vapour and the like, and other gases. If the, skin is, if the lung lining is scarred, it can't function as effectively. Now as builders, I'm sure you've all probably got a, a good scar on your hand or your leg or somewhere. And if you look at that scar, the, the surface of that scar is different to the surrounding skin. If you have it on your finger, you might notice that the fingerprints just aren't exactly the same. It's the same within your lungs. If the lungs are scarred, they're not going to work as effectively. If your lungs don't work, unfortunately you will die. Of course, if you smoke, there's an increased risk as well because if you have a scarred lung plus smoking, there's a direct link that, uh, of the damage that can be caused. Lung cancer. Asbestos is a known carcinogen. A carcinogen is something that, that has the potential to cause cancer or will cause cancer depending on its category. Asbestos exposure may not become apparent until up to 40 years after the event. So you may have an, an exposure event today and it will be many, many years before the health risks become apparent. So that is why if we have apprentices working with us today or young people, not only ourselves but you know, those, those who are younger than us, we must make sure that they don't or are not potentially exposed because it won't become apparent for another 30, 40 odd years down the track and by that stage we won't be able to do, personally be able to do much about it. Mesothelioma is a, is a cancer of the actual pleural lining of the lungs and again it presents 20 to 50 years after exposure. As far as I'm aware at this point in time there is no proven method to determine whether or not you have asbestos exposure in your lungs. You have to see a medical practitioner, that's beyond my uh, realm of knowledge uh, to determine if there's any health related issues. So if you're on a building site and you may be doing a knockdown, you may be preparing for a renovation and you come across some material that you think may be asbestos, you're not too sure, i.e. it's not your Super 6 lining, it's not millboard, it hasn't been, you haven't been informed that it is asbestos containing it should be sampled and analysed. And the person who undertakes the sampling should be competent for that purpose and the sampling should be undertaken by appropriate qualified labs. If you work in a commercial setting, that business should have an asbestos register. So you should be able to go to them and say, I understand you want me to re-roof the building or we're going to put an extension on here or we're going to demolish this wing is there any asbestos present or known within the building? And you want to know that information up front so that if there is, you can get that asbestos material removed before you and your workers and colleagues go in and start doing your work to prevent the potential for exposure. And this is what we just touched on here. All businesses in New South Wales are to have a register which details the type, condition, location of known asbestos containing materials on that site. And it's found in our New South Wales OHS regulation in Clause 44. Something else that we may come across from time to time is lead. Lead is no longer, to my understanding, used as a waterproofing or a damp coursing or a flashing. However, lead is quite often found in dust. I recently did some work up in Chatswood here in Sydney. It was an older style building. It was a formerly a Federation style house which had been converted to office use, so therefore it was around 80 years old was close to the Pacific Highway, they wanted to actually put a new ceiling in. So they're going to drop the existing ceiling, which was uh, like a, a batten and 
plaster type finish and put a new ceiling in. But they said there's a lot of dust up there. Would like to get it checked out, see if there's any contaminants or any hazardous materials in that dust. Took a sample of the dust. Now there was enough lead in that dust that you could have made, from that sample, you could have probably made a couple of sinkers out of it. You couldn't actually see the lead, but it was present within the dust. How'd that, dust, how'd that lead get in the dust? For, for many years, being close to the railway line and close to the Pacific Highway, all the vehicles travelling backwards and forwards using leaded fuel, that lead is precipitated out of the air. So when you're going to an older style building or a floor cavity or in particular the ceiling cavity where there's a heavy build up of dust, you want to, if possible, make sure that there's no lead present. If uh, you have a young female working with you uh, or someone who is pregnant or may be pregnant or is breastfeeding, they should not be exposed to lead and neither should children because it will, uh, the lead takes a, a, quite a while to leave the body, it uh, collects in the bones and there's good evidence that, uh, that the lead in children can affect their um, learning ability and will also uh, affect the unborn child if the lady happens to be pregnant. Lead was commonly used in paint. A lot of the old buildings, if you scrape through the various layers, you'll find that the first couple of layers contain lead. And if your profession is a, is a painter or a paint removalist, you will come across lead in paint and that continual exposure can build up a high level of lead in your body. Synthetic mineral fibre, also known as glass wool, rock wool, slag wool, used as an insulation material. It was introduced as an asbestos substitute. It's an irritant and a possible carcinogen. The jury's still out on that, but it's certainly an irritant. It's itchy wool. You may have come across it, it can create an itch. But again, being a fibrous material, it can enter the lungs, lead to health effects. These are photos that I've taken in a uh, building in the city, in the plant room. What happened was they were saying, oh, had all these bits of SMF coming out of the air conditioning ductwork. This is the stuff you can see, it's the stuff you can't see that causes the problem. And the next couple of slides will just show the various pieces of SMF. So did a bit of an investigation, I went up into the ductwork and they had some people putting in some new fan motors and they had damaged the inside lining and hadn't bothered to repair it. So as the air is travelling through the ductwork, it's just picking up the SMF and it's getting entrained in the duct and being blown out. This is another site, this was a school, and whoever done the insulation work had just decided to leave their rubbish lying around for someone else. Creosote was commonly used with places like Energy Australia and the like to prevent, uh, to protect the telegraph poles from white ants and the like. Has a very smoky, bitumen-like smell to it. It's a complex mixture of chemicals, more often black than brown, very tarry. You can have exposure to creosote through inhalation of the fumes, through ingestion if you happen to have some on your fingers and you get onto your food, etc. Or dermal through your skin eye if you get any splashed on you. It's a known uh, carcinogen. Um, that it, it's not used anymore. Arsenic compounds was used to treat uh, your pine, etc. And, that, and the, the use of arsenic trioxide and crop chrome arsenate have been, are being phased out. It's a, it's a poison. I appreciate your time and, and listening to me stand up here and talk. I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Um, were you saying that there's no way you can go to a doctor and find out if you have previously inhaled anything until after the fact? And you know you've actually you know showing symptoms. Like you need to see one. You need to see a later? medical expert to get the correct answer. Yeah, well, my right. understanding is, until the symptoms display, they won't show up on the X-ray. Right. That's my understanding. Yeah. Until the actual scarring or the shadowing of the lung appears, they won't sit on the x-ray. But the asbestos fibres may be within your, within your lungs mm. prior to that shadowing on the x-ray appearing. Okay. Any questions? Yeah, would you recommend uh, pumping out like every sirloin that we, before we start work? Because there's obviously, you know, there'd be lead and everything up there. Like it, it depends some on of it's that thick. The dust, mm -hmm. it, it, you must do what is reasonably practicable. 
it depends on the, the contaminants within that dust. It may just be dust. It depends on the work that you're going to be undertaking. But it was a very dusty environment at a minimum. I'd be wearing a mask so that as I walked through that ceiling cavity or crawled through it or the floor cavity, I didn't kick up and create any dust which I could inhale. Our lungs are pretty delicate things. We don't want to go yeah. clagging them up. And, and if we wanted something tested, what we contact, say, you guys? There is a number of people out there who undertake sampling and analysis and um, a, a web search or a Google search will bring up a, a, a list of people. And what would you test like anything over 50 years old? Um. Again, you would have to look at the context of the building, <coughs> its age, etc., and what the work that was being undertaken. As looking at the asbestos side of things, work cover recommends that the asbestos should be removed if it's safe to do so. But if it's in a, a part of the building which is frequently visited, it's in good condition, it's, the likelihood is that it's going to be, remain undisturbed for some time. More often than not, it's better to leave it there and make a note of it on the register because sometimes the removal can actually create a bigger problem. And is it the go to hose it before you muck around with it? Or? Asbestos? Yeah. Or a spiber, no. No, uh, no abrasive, no sawing, cutting, hitting with air, air hose or, no, or, mean, hosing, or hosing down. You can, that's abrasive water hosing. If, no, you're, no, if you're going to just, like a, a light, it'd be a light mist. Yeah. And, and people who undertake reno, um, removal of asbestos products, i.e. fibro, will sometimes employ a, a light water mist Definitely to help suppress down. the dust. Yeah, oh, thank you. Common problems on demolition sites is from the neighbours complaining. How do we deal with that? I mean, you can never explain it or just justify to them it's okay. If the demolition is, is a, uh, involves the removal of asbestos, there'd be an AS1 licensed removalist on site. They should have obviously done their safe work method statements, which is based on their risk assessments, etc. have the necessary work cover permits. Quite often they'll employ air monitoring, and what that does is demonstrates the effectiveness of the controls for the removal process. So they actually have a certified piece of paper given by an individual, sorry, an independent third party. So they can say to their neighbours or others in the, in the area saying, the removal was undertaken in the prescribed manner and the controls were effective. And we have what's known as a clearance certificate here to say that all visible or identifiable asbestos containing material within this area has been removed and it's safe for normal work to proceed. There was one occasion where the wind was quite strong. It was blowing in that particular direction and she insisted that we stop or all hell will break loose. The wind can be an issue, especially on large open sites yeah. uh, where, like a brownfield site, where the wind will move across Typical and pick Typical suburban up. block. Yep. Yeah. And again, you know, you then only, not only have an issue with, um, you know, potential asbestos, if there was asbestos on that site, but you've also got dust or dirt leaving the site and local councils don't like that and neither does the... Uh, Department of Energy, uh, Environment and mm. Conservation, you know, materials should not leave the work site. So you have to have some sort of dust suppression in place. It could be water misting, it could be a water truck. Okay. Your stockpile under them covered, etc. I'm not sure whether you answered or it was the same question before, but if you come across asbestos in a, in a house or, you know, a commercial site or something like that, um, and you, you choose not to remove it for some reason or not, is, it, is there a laws in place that say that you know, you're doing um, something illegal by not letting somebody know, by putting it on a register? Do okay. you have to put That's it a good on a question. register? That's a good question because unless you hold an AS1 licence or the appropriate licence to remove bonded asbestos material, you are not allowed to remove that material. Yep. If it's a commercial or industrial premises, they should have an asbestos register on site as prescribed in the New South Wales Occupational Health and Safety Regulation 2001. If you come across a hazardous material or for that matter any other hazard in the workplace, you should stop work and report that hazard so that the appropriate controls can be put in place. So if you're in a, uh, a ceiling cavity, for example, and you came across a red belly black, you know, having a nice little snooze, you wouldn't just leave it there, you'd tell someone and they'd get it removed. So likewise, if you found sort of unearthed electrical systems, um, leaking hot water systems, asbestos, or something else that you thought was a hazard, yeah, you should cease work and you'd actually report that 
to either your supervisor or the site controller. Yeah, but even say, I, I know like in a commercial site, it's certainly more something that people stick to guidelines and rules, or, you know, it, everything is generally reported, but in a residential situation, obviously, you know, with a house or whatever, and a lot yep. of people are, say, yep. sheeting over asbestos yep. now as opposed to pulling it out. Yep. You know, is there... I guess from your point of view, sense I guess from your point of view, you're actually at that residential site. Uh, you're, you've been employed as a task. It's your work site. Yeah. And so therefore, you are. You have to follow the rules as prescribed in the New South Wales OHS Act and regulation, mm. or any other guidelines or instructions as issued by work cover. So because it may be my house, you might be undertaking work at my house, but it's your place of work. Mm. And so therefore you have to do what is reasonably practicable to meet your requirements for your place of work. No, no, I'm saying you'd have to get an assessment and it depends on the nature of the job and what's being done. It depends on the nature of the job. If you if they're putting an extension on the gable's gonna be then you're extending it out. I'm not a builder, but it all depends on the, on the nature of the job. If you have some, for example, you might have um, some fibro sheeting in a, um, in a floor cavity in a part of a building which, is, which no one ever goes to, you'd mark it on the register, you'd put a sign outside the door saying asbestos materials products are within and you'd leave it there because the removal may actually require accessing a confined space, um, it might be very difficult to access, etc it may create a bigger risk in handling it. For example, you might have some asbestos um, where you have to climb up a, you know, that's at a height of 50 metres, for example. It's in good condition and no one's going to go there. So you have to apply a bit of common sense and, and take into consideration and apply your risk management to determine. And, and again, if it comes to re removal of asbestos, you'd seek advice and guidance from the appropriately licensed person so who can actually assist you in making that decision. Yeah, uh, how much does, <coughs> a, does a lead or asbestos test cost and how long does it take? You'd have to contact the various um, laboratories or people that provide that service, but the um, results for asbestos, I know, can be given in less than 24 hours lead does take longer because it's a more detailed scientific analysis that has to take place. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, oh, thank you, Alan. Really appreciate it. Um, just one question, if I may. Um, I think I asked you the IBC mould. Um, is that one, I mean, one of the latest concerns that we've got in buildings, do you think? Mould is a growing issue. Mould's a very big issue in America. The style of housing that we have here or building now is different to what it was 20 or 30 odd years ago in that a lot of homes now have, they rely on air conditioning systems, they have sealed windows, they don't have the same ventilation, they don't have the same subfloor ventilation, they're built on slabs, etc. Mould is, is an increasing problem. At my place of work, we're getting more mould inquiries, especially after uh, hot, humid weather. Mould can affect those who have uh, who are immunosuppressed or have a respiratory ailment, or if you have small children in the house, particularly those who suffer from asthma, they can, uh, they can have quite a severe reaction to mould exposure. Mould does not have to be alive to cause a problem. It can be living mould, it can be the spores of mould, or even mould that is dead. The flakes of it still have the potential to cause respiratory ailments. Thanks again. Thank you, Alan. All right, uh, gentlemen, that's close to the end. I know Phil Sim wants to have a couple of words to you. Um, when we do finish, please take your assessment sheets with you, filled out. If any questions you're not sure of, there is a, um, a sample sheet there that'll assist you. You'll get your CBD report. Uh, and if you missed uh, our previous meeting, there is a DVD and a question sheet for the alternative dispute resolution theory meets practice. Um, thank you all for coming and I'll just call on Phil Sim to close the meeting. Thank you. Fellow ABS builders, we don't advertise and sell things, but tonight,
for the presentation, we've got a drill which is the only type in the world like it. Now I'll just pull it out of the box here. That's the extension. Drill. To heavy duty drill, the motor is an AEG. To reasonable size, this is the beautiful part. This here does a 90 degree angle. Just by turning around, everything is done by finger tight. These little black knobs, turn it, adjust it, like so. There it is, or any other angle that you may wish to have. Now, what we'll do is put it into the drill. Put it in, she comes in, comes in there, the cover plate comes this way here. Once again, no Allen keys or any other keys to hold it. There's your drill. Now you can adjust the end whichever way you want to go. We want to go around more. There it is. We'd go this way here, bringing it around. Now there's your right angle or near as, depending how you adjust it. Again, just goes around wherever you want it to be. If you can't get to something because of the drill, it's not long enough, this is where the extension comes in. Or she comes again. We then put on the extension. Again, she comes around, fits the plate when we find it. There it is there. Up goes the cover plate which will lock it in, two handles, then put the cover back on and then you've got the extension which goes back out the end. Round she goes, there you've got it there now. Now you've got places where to go up on the angle or down, around, in kitchen cupboards, wherever. Now that drill is the only type, as I said, in the world like it at the present time doing a 90 degree turn. There's an electric one as well as this battery one. It comes with two batteries. The batteries for four and a half hours to charge. They'll last you all day. Now for any further references We've got a plumber has had this for approximately six months and he now says he can't do without it. We've got given it to a builder, obviously another drill to a builder and the same, he has now put a written testimony that he just can't do without his as well. So that's the drill. You won't buy it at Bunnings. We only had uh, approximately about 80 of them. We've got about uh, just under 20 of these left at the present stage. They're selling exactly, apart from the packaging, at $450, including GST. $450, and the electric one is $350. To make any more inquiries, you know the drill. Either get hold of to Alan on the form or the slip that comes out. Phone us, email us, um, and we'll give you whatever information you want. Thanks very much. Okay, just as a close-up again to finalise, there it is here, the drill there. Again, we'll put it into the drill before we alter it this time. Wait for the connection, there it is. Sleeve comes up. Trying to do this with one hand just to show you. Okay, we'll do it with two hands. Going around. Just doing it. There she goes now. Finger tight. Okay, now we've got the universal part at the end. Again, what angle do we want? We'll move that around there. This one will go that way. Again, it's showing you which way to go. Padlocks. Locked, unlocked, 
and just keep playing with it until you get the desired angle which we're now looking for. Here we come. Oops, there we go. There we go. There we go there now. Now it should go down, around, or we'll lock it in. If we wish to lock it in now, just move that there around. Then she's at a right angle. Back over that way. Absolutely fantastic. Instead of trying to put a drill any other way to get in there, there it is there now. Once you've used it, you will just carry on using it all the time. You, you will not use your other drills. Okay, and we take it off. Just release the cover. There she is. Comes apart. Back in the box. With the universal, we just straighten it out. Turn the wheels around. Again, there's the locks to show you which way. Coming around now, just about lined up. That one there, still on an angle, or just straighten it. There she is, straight. And back in the box. Still got the extension for that extra length. Save your back when you're drilling down or easy when you're drilling up with a sleeve. That's it. Back in the box. Full box, heavy duty. Clips, clips. Box tells you what it does. There is everything there. The attachable keyless chucks all down here. And one year warranty just here, which you won't require.